All right, hey, I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, so for today's uh, Modern War Institute uh, speaker series, my pleasure to introduce uh, General Bob Kaler, who is the commander of U.S. Strategic uh, Command. In that role, we provided the President and the Secretary of Defense with broad range of strategic capabilities and options for the joint warfighter war through several diverse mission areas, including combating weapons of mass destruction, integrated missile defense, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, and global strike. General Kaler entered the Air Force in 1975 as a distinguished graduate of the uh, Penn State University Air Force ROTC program. He commanded a Minuteman ICBM Operations Squadron at Whitman Air Force Base in Montana, uh, Air Force's largest ICBM operations group at Maelstrom Air Force Base, Montana, the 30th Space Wing at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, the 21st Space Wing at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado, Air Force Space Command and America's ICBM Force before its transition from Air Force Space Command to Air Force Global Strike Command in December of 2009. He retired from the Air Force in 2014 after over 38 years of distinguished service. He currently consults and serves on a number of corporate boards, a senior fellow of the National Defense University and associate fellow with the uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and astronautics. He has testified before numerous congressional committees and speaks widely on matters of national security. Sir, welcome. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for inviting me. I've spent a, a very interesting morning uh, with the, the staff uh, of, the, of the Warfare Institute, and I will tell you, I think they're doing some great things. Uh, it, it really is a a time that's worthy of your consideration for modern war. Um, you know, we've gotten accustomed to thinking about conflict in a certain way because of our experience over the last 15 plus years. And I think as valuable as those lessons have been, there are some really bad lessons we can learn from that as well. Uh, one of those lessons is that all conflict will look that way in the future, uh, which I know all of you know that that won't be the case. Another bad lesson we can learn is that somehow it is a God-given right for U.S. forces to operate in an environment that has air and space and cyber superiority. And that's not going to happen uh, in the future either. In fact, that won't happen today uh, if we get into a different kind of a conflict. Uh, and it's also a bad lesson to believe that uh, somehow uh, the entire range of capabilities that the United States of America can bring to war fighting uh, is, is irrelevant. That somehow at the end of the Cold War, something changed fundamentally and therefore some of the things that we relied on during the Cold War, like nuclear weapons, no longer matter. So what I want to talk to you about for the next 20 minutes or so, and then I would just offer, please feel free to jump in at any time. You don't have to wait till the end, but, but I, I want to make sure that I talk about the things that interest you. Uh, I'll talk for maybe 20 minutes or so, and then we can have a conversation about some of these subjects. Let me begin by saying, in an environment like this with theater seating, it reminds me of a story where an usher in a movie theater was uh, called by somebody who said, hey, there's some guy laying across three seats down here in the theater, and nobody can get in there. Would you do something about it? The usher came down and said, shine the light down and said, hey, buddy, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to get up and move. You're taking up three seats. And the guy made some kind of indistinct or something. The usher says, no, hey, look, I'm going to have to go get the police if you don't move. And the same deal, the guy didn't say much, he kind of mumbled something. He said, okay. He goes out and he gets a police officer. They come back down, the police officer says, hey, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to move out of there. And the guy mumbles something, and the police officer finally in frustration said, but where did you come from? The guy says, the balcony. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. There's no balcony in here though. So good news is if you're laying across three seats, you have to sit up now. So, hey. Um, it's, it was fashionable at the end of the Cold War, and by the way, I've been around long enough to have served about half my career in the Cold War. I started off in intercontinental ballistic missiles, as you heard. 
Uh, I did get sent to the middle of Montana for my first assignment as a second lieutenant. I had to look on an atlas to figure out which one Montana was, by the way. Turns out it's one of the big ones. And uh, you, can, you can tell, usually in the evening, if you're watching the national news in the wintertime, it's the one that the snowman is usually on in uh, the weather part of the conversation. So it's, it's remote. Uh, that's why those ICBMs are out there, by the way. That's the, the uh, missile complex that I served in for the first time. Uh, covered 24,000 square miles. That missile complex was large, uh, as large as the New England states. And uh, it was interesting because we were still, we were flying UH-1s then, still are, <laughs> H-1Ns. Uh, they couldn't fly across the complex from corner to corner without stopping to refuel. Big, big area, big wide open area there uh, of Montana. And uh, I didn't know anything about the intercontinental ballistic missile business at all. I didn't volunteer for that coming out of ROTC, but it's like most things that you will all discover. No one asked me. <laughs> they said, here are your orders. This is where we need you. And I said, terrific. Uh, and I thought I was going to be around for four years, my initial obligation, and then I would be out doing something else. And almost 39 years later, uh, I hung it up. So it turns out that uh, I liked it, it seemed to like me, and that led to about half of my career uh, being associated with intercontinental ballistic missiles and, and related kind of things. The other half, once the Cold War ended, uh, I wound up in the space part of the Air Force. And so I spent about the second half of my career in the space business. And so <clears throat> that was, it was interesting. In both ends of this, both on the ICBM and and on the space end, when you go around and talk about that to the rest of the U.S. military force, you get a lot of this. Not direct experience with it. In fact, if you go throughout our military force today, and I used to discover this even toward the end of my time on active duty, and I would say, during the Cold War, fill in the blank. As it turns out, people today have served complete, complete, careers since the Cold War ended. You say Cold War to the young troops today, they have no earthly idea what you're talking about. They might remember something about it from the books that they've read or maybe some history that they've taken, but they have no direct experience in any of that. And so when you say, no, no, you need to do this the way we used to do it in the Cold War, people don't get it. And when you say to them, Space stuff, you know, it's that space stuff. You're as likely to get, I don't need any of that space stuff, I've got this GPS thing right here. <laughs> so, it's interesting, I think, for you to think about, so what do I need to know about all that stuff? Why do I need to pay attention to this part of the conversation? Then I would assert to you, if you add cyberspace to this in particular, you need to be as comfortable with these subjects as you are about other subjects that aren't directly maybe in your expected career. I was not an aviator, and yet I know what we do with airplanes. I knew what we did with airplanes when I was on active duty. I certainly knew what we did with them when I became a senior commander and a combatant commander. I never served a day in the infantry, but I know kind of what the infantry does. I know what artillery does. I know what it's for. But go ask an artilleryman if they know anything about space, and they'll say, nope, don't have to, except maybe for this GPS thing that I use to align or whatever you use it for, and it's for a lot. So we had this feeling at the end of the Cold War that we could finally say, that nuclear thing, that was bad, good thing it's over now. We can walk away from this, we can turn our back on it. And in fact, as a nation, we said to ourselves a couple of important things at the policy level. One thing we said was, Russia and China are not our enemies. They may be our competitors, but they are not our enemies. The other thing that we said, I thought this was interesting, was we're gonna shift our priorities on nuclear-related things from deterrence to reduction. 
and counterproliferation. We don't want any more of these things to get made. We don't want any other country to get them. And we want to work toward a goal of zero nuclear weapons in the world. By the way, every president since Harry Truman has said the same thing. We need to work to eliminate nuclear weapons. Reagan said something a little different. Reagan said, I don't want to eliminate them. I want to replace them, which is a little different. He was going to replace them with what he thought was high quality, high assurance missile defense. It's what everybody nicknamed Star Wars. And someone said to me, uh, interestingly, there were three people who believed that you could actually do it. One was Reagan. One was a, an Air Force Lieutenant General named Abramson who ran the Missile Defense Agency at the time, and the third one was Mikhail Gorbachev. And the only one that mattered was Mikhail Gorbachev. He believed we could do it. And that may actually be the thing that, that was the final straw that brought the end of the Cold War. May have been. Now, I've been telling that story for a long time. I was never quite sure that it was accurate. I saw Abramson last week at a symposium. And I said, General, I've been telling a story about you for a long time, and here's the story. I told him that exact story. I said, can I keep telling that story? He said, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I said, did you think we could do it? He said, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. If we had spent the money and done the things that, that we thought we could do, I said, and President Reagan believed it, oh yeah, he said, yep. And I said, and of course the Gorbachev part I think is pretty clear, he bought it. But we thought we could walk away from a lot of things at the end of the Cold War. And it turns out, and in fact, we even pursued something called the peace dividend, which caused a dramatic reduction in our military forces. When I was a younger officer, when I was assigned in Washington, I would drive by Fort Belvoir. And you knew that you were near an Army installation because every October, there was a big open field outside the gate at Belvoir, and every October it was covered with tents, and they were having their Oktoberfest. And that's because all of your predecessors were deployed to Germany. Everybody had been there. The entire U.S. Army, almost the entire meaningful U.S. Army, was deployed there. Looking across the inter-German border at another million and a half or so soldiers. And all of this was this big face-off in the Cold War that ultimately was um, deterred, I believe, because of nuclear weapons. So the peace dividend went along. We finally decided uh, that, that uh, the world maybe wasn't such a good place. 9-11 happened. And since that time, we've been almost singularly focused in a certain way. Remember, in Desert Shield in the early 1990s, and then in Desert Storm in the early 1990s, a large part of the US military deployed to the Persian Gulf, fought a war to eject Iraq from Kuwait. And the Air Force's piece of that never came home. They stayed. And they were there flying combat missions almost every day in Iraq after Desert Storm through the time that we went back in again. Our focus went somewhere else. With no argument from me about whether it should have gone there, but the facts are that our focus went there. So there's a professor at Yale named Paul Bracken who has written a book called The Second Nuclear Age. And the second nuclear age essentially says nuclear weapons never went away. And in fact, the way you have to think about them today isn't as a repeat of act one, but as act two. And I think that's exactly right. The way we have to think about nuclear weapons today is how we have to apply them today. They haven't gone away. We're not going to get to zero, certainly not in my lifetime, not as far into the strategic future as I can see. 
And so the question is, what do they do for us? What do they do for our national security? Why do we have them? Henry Kissinger once famously said, look, nuclear weapons are for a purpose. You have to decide how do they fit into our national security strategy and how do they influence our diplomacy? I would tell you that I think that nuclear weapons are used every single day. They're not employed every single day. Thank heaven. That's the objective. They're used by the countries that own them, certainly, for purposes of deterrence and coercion. They're even used by people who don't have them. Look at Iran. Iran uses nuclear weapons that it doesn't even have. It uses them pretty effectively, too, by the way. So, we have them. They're not going to go away. They're going to be around for as far into the future as I can certainly see, and probably as far as you can see as well, because nothing else has the same deterrent effect. Nothing else has the same deterrent characteristic. Nothing else has the same deterrent effect as a nuclear weapon. They create risks that are so high that no one wants to take the risk. And that's the paradox of the nuclear age. The paradox is that in order to prevent their use, you have to be prepared to use them. And you have to be able to use them with some credible uh, backdrop to that. You have to have credible forces. You have to have credible command and control. You have to have credible circumstances. And so today, nuclear weapons are just one of the tools in the strategic toolkit. In the Cold War, we used to say nuclear deterrence and strategic deterrence synonymously. In the same sentence, we would say, so our strategic forces what we meant was our nuclear forces. So our nuclear forces at the strategic level, you know, we just we kind of lumped all that together today. And when I was commanding STRATCOM, I would go look at the Unified Command Plan, which is signed by the president, says, this is what I want the commanders of the combatant commands to do. I thought that was a pretty important document, by the way. I carried that one around with me. Something from the commander in chief that said, not STRATCOM is responsible for, but the commander of STRATCOM is responsible for. That put the who in it. And so I thought that was a pretty important document. And in there, someone well before me said STRATCOM commander's responsibilities are to lead strategic deterrence planning and nuclear employment. And I thought, wait a minute, they're making a distinction here strategic deterrence, and nuclear employment. And so what we now know is that there are a lot of strategic tools that need to be put together for deterrence purposes today. Nuclear weapons are one of those tools. There are others. Missile defense is a strategic deterrence tool. Our ability to project power is a strategic deterrence tool. There are others. Cyberspace can be, I think we're still thinking our way through this, a strategic deterrence tool. Think about what's changed in warfare here. If you look at the characteristics of warfare, you know, General Mattis, now Secretary Mattis, I've heard him give this speech before. He talks about, look, warfare hasn't changed over the centuries. It's still an ugly business between human beings for political purposes. No argument from me. But what has changed are the characteristics of warfare. Think about time and distance and boundaries and symmetry and ambiguity. And think about when we started to do things beyond throwing rocks at one another. Time and distance and boundaries were defined by how fast human beings could march and the obstacles they encountered on the way. You all have studied this in great detail. Think about the obstacles that the Blue Ridge Mountains presented to forces during our Civil War. Would those present those obstacles today? Of course not. Of course not. Rivers, even in World War II, I just reread Omar Bradley's book, A Soldier's Story. Talks about the tremendous barrier that the Rhine River was. Now think about that today. How much different that would look today. Just crossing Omaha Beach, 
I would argue we wouldn't do that today. We wouldn't even do that today, let alone that way. Time and distance and boundaries have changed remarkably. When horses came out of the battlefield, time and distance and boundaries changed. When ships came into use, time and distance and boundaries changed. When airplanes came along, time and distance and boundaries changed. Those things that used to define the boundaries for warfare no longer existed when an airplane could fly over it. Space changed it again. You can now cover global distances in minutes. In some cases, you're, it looks like you're hovering there anyway. If you're at geo and your orbital period happens to be 24 hours and that's how long it takes the Earth to go around, it looks like from the ground you're standing still. Cyberspace, you can now cover global distances in milliseconds for military purposes. Everything has changed. That's a strategic tool. Somebody can hold our homeland at risk now below the nuclear threshold. And so one of the big changes that has occurred since the Cold War is this ability of strategic threat below the nuclear threshold to be a real tool. And not only is it a tool for threat, but it's a tool for deterrence. The other big thing that's changed since the end of the Cold War is this notion of deterrence and tailored deterrence. So today, if we're talking about deterrence, we're still talking about the concepts that say, look, deterrence is really about your ability to convince somebody. It's, about a, it's a convincing exercise. If you can convince them that they can't achieve their objectives, or that if they try, they are going to receive unacceptable consequences, or both, that's deterrence. That's the formula for deterrence. And we've had that in our kit bag for years, long before there was a Cold War. If you remember from your studies, the Great White Fleet that the United States built and sailed around the world, that was done for deterrence purposes. That was iron battleships. Forward deploying the US Army to the Philippines was done for deterrence purposes. And so this notion of deterrence has been around for a very long time. What changed with nuclear weapons was the risk that goes with nuclear weapons. Think about this. When I was a young crew member in ICBMs, we used to tell ourselves, and our seniors used to tell us this. I remember sitting in audiences like this, getting ready to go out for an alert, and they would, in your pre-departure briefing, somebody, usually a colonel, would stand up and say, you all are under more, you, you all command and control more military power in one of your squadrons than was unleashed in all of World War II. And everybody would go, wow, that sounds pretty big. <laughs> but here's the part that they didn't say. What really makes that risky is that you can deliver it, not in five years, but in five hours. No society has ever, ever dealt with that level and scope and scale of devastation before. No one. And so despite all the studies and despite all the discussions we've had and despite all of the uh, way that we've talked about this over the years and the theories, this is incredible risk for decision makers anywhere to decide, I'm going to risk that. So nuclear weapons are not gone and they're not gonna be gone anytime soon. But they're one tool in a toolkit now that we need to leverage appropriately because in some cases, if your threat is something below the nuclear threshold, or if your threat is a limited number of nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera, you may not think it's credible if our answer to that is, sorry, one size fits all. We would treat you the same way we treat the Russians or we would treat the Russians at a small scale the same way we would treat them in a massive attack scale, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't fit. In some cases, you would say, no, I can deter you, North Korea. I have nuclear weapons I can use if I need to, but I can deter you with missile defenses. I can guarantee you that even if you decide in that worst day to take a war shot at us with a nuclear weapon, that it's not gonna get to its target, and then, it's gonna be unambiguous about whether or not you cross that threshold. 
itself. One is part of a tool kit. Two, it has to be tailored. Deterrence has to be tailored. At the end of the Cold War, we knew a lot about the Soviets. We had studied them for years. We saw them through transparency measures in arms control. They saw us. We watched them exercise. We watched them produce things. We watched them test things. We had established a set of rules over the years that defined what that relationship was going to be like. What did stability look like? Where were the limits on how far we would go? How much you would push somebody? Whether or not we had appropriate controls over our nuclear forces to guarantee that when that flock of geese took off in a crisis, that people wouldn't start reacting until they thought for a few minutes about what was happening. Where is that understanding today for China and North Korea and India and Pakistan? And do the two nuclear superpowers, because the Russians are only a superpower in the nuclear world. They're not a superpowered uh, country anywhere else. Saw an interesting thing the other day showed world populations. Do you know there are almost as many Japanese as there are Russians? We need to remind ourselves of that sometimes. They are a population in decline for a lot of reasons. But they still represent a singular threat to us, a threat that no one else poses to us, which is why they still have to be deterred even as we are digging deeper into some of these other potential adversaries to be able to tailor our deterrence to them. So, Nuclear Weapons Act II. When you hear people say, well, it's the Cold War all over again, run away from them. It's not, it isn't the Cold War all over again. I used to get accused of that. People would say, you're the commander of STRATCOM, right? Yep. So, ah, you're those Cold War guys. I say, no, actually, I thought for quite some time that STRATCOM was probably the least Cold War focused command you'd ever want to be around. But part of the problem is we did turn our back on thinking about all of this. And so your challenge, I think, as, as young officers and as national security professionals of whatever kind is to not turn your back on these issues. How does this influence how you operate? Are these still the foundation of our national security? I believe they are. Certainly we've gone 30 plus years without a major recapitalization of them. And like with any military system, at some point you reach the inevitable end of your service life. Whether you're a human being or whether you're a piece of hardware, you reach the end of your service life. And that's where we are with our nuclear deterrent today. Our nuclear deterrent today is, is nowhere near really where it was at the height of the Cold War. Today, we and the Russians have 1,550 operationally deployed long-range nuclear weapons, 1,550. There was a time in the Cold War when that number on both sides approached 10,000. Can you imagine that? Somebody said to me one time, I was a joint, I was a staff officer in J5 on the joint staff as a major and we were working with the Secretary of Defense and the chairman, the chairman was General Powell at the time, and we were working with them to try to convince ourselves that the United States and Russia could go to what became the START-1 treaty, which I think was 3,800 deployed weapons, down from, I don't know, 8,500 or some huge number. And uh, we used to talk about this, and I was briefing in the tank, and more than that's where the, the Joint Chiefs meet to have their meetings. And I was briefing in there, and we were talking about if one nuclear weapon went off in a city in the United States, is that a big deal? The answer is, yep, that's a big deal. Is that the biggest catastrophe that the nation has ever faced? Probably not. Could the nation recover from that? Yes. OK, how about 10 in our 10 largest cities? And people say, um, is that the biggest catastrophe we ever faced? Yep, I think so. Could the nation recover from that? 
and people start to tug at their chin a little bit. Um, okay, how about a hundred? How about a thousand? So, could you safely reduce the numbers? Yeah, I think arms control is a good thing. It makes us safer. That's why you do it, by the way. It makes us more secure. You don't do it because it's just arms control, and it's verifiable. If those two conditions are met, I was always in favor of reductions. I don't think you can go to zero because nothing else has that deterrent value. And I would argue, I'm one of those who believes that since August of 1945, when the two weapons were employed in combat by the United States, that nuclear weapons have limited warfare. Hasn't stopped all warfare, didn't expect that it would, but it is certainly redefined and limited major power war. And I think that continues because of their deterrent value and their deterrent effect. So, we have them, they're gonna be around for a while. The rules have changed. I think it's important for all of us to think very carefully about how those rules get applied as we go from here to the future. And with that, let me stop my, my harangue and ask you what you want to talk about. What, what would you like to chat about here? Ma'am. Um, sir, thank you for being with us today. Um, so I think my first question would be, um, Kim Jong-un and President Trump are meeting at the end of May for their first summit together, and do you think that they will go with a strategy of deterrence, or, and that's specifically from President Trump's perspective, or do you think it's going to be um, a myriad of options, because um, currently the, the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs Committee has suggested that he should be looking at deterrence, but he should also be looking at a long-term strategy, so I wanted to ask you what your opinion is on that. Yeah, great question. Thank you for the question, I'll tell you. Um, we were just talking about this at lunch. Wow. Um, so so let's, let's start with this. Let's back up for a second. Let's say this is a joint planning problem for all of us, and, and we're going to think about this. First of all, uh, the Army uh, has this great thing at the beginning of the planning process called campaign design. You probably all I hope have heard about that. Maybe the Army is calling us something different since I've retired, but campaign design was, was um, a phrase that the Army put uh, at the front end of the planning process because I think the concern among the joint forces were we do a good job um, going through a problem-solving exercise once you give us a problem. That's JOPES. That's the Joint Operational Planning and Execution System, which I, I suspect all of you have heard about. But what we don't do a good job of is defining the problem. So before we go off to solve a problem, we probably ought to define the problem. And so <clears throat> is the problem here that the threat has changed? Is the problem that the U.S. is now threatened directly? Uh, what's the problem? The threat, I, I think certainly the threat has grown from North Korea once they became nuclear armed. This is not a surprise that they became nuclear armed. We knew this was going to happen from the mid-1990s, basically, when everybody knew they had a program. They kind of went in fits and starts. We tried various times to get them to throttle back on it. President Carter, after he retired, went over there during the crisis in the mid-1990s and back and forth. But it no, should be no surprise to anybody that they finally got nuclear weapons. Somehow, though, we defined this problem as being time urgent. And my personal view, now this is my personal opinion, I don't think this is a time urgent problem. What you hear in the popular press reported is, but they can threaten the United States with an ICBM. And the answer is to that, I, the United States has been threatened by ICBMs from Russia and China since the 1960s. That's not new for us. We understand that part. The second part to the urgency thing is, yeah, but this is a madman. I don't think that's true either. I don't think we like the way he behaves. And I think we find his behavior to be strange, at, at the least. <laughs> and I don't think anybody would argue that. I don't think he's a madman. And so um, I think that's another piece to the, to the we've got to do something quickly uh, calculus for defining this problem that I don't buy into. I've never believed that you must do something now. Um, that you must take military action now. Let me say, I think you have to do something, but I, but I am not convinced that that's military action. 
because of the risks involved here. I think that these risks are enormous. Uh, so I, I think that, that it's an interesting conversation, but it would begin with, in my view, I do not believe this is a time urgent matter that you have, that, that dictates whether or not military force has to be applied. The second part to the problem is, um, it, it, are, we, are we trying to get them to eliminate, get them to reduce, get them to, you know, what is it we want them to do here? Well, we say denuclearize, no weapons on the Korean Peninsula. And I would certainly be in favor of that, but I also think that's a long-term problem. I do not believe, and I could be completely wrong here, but I, I do not believe that Kim Jong-un is going to come to the table in May or June and say, I am giving up my nuclear weapons. I, I could be wrong. Things have surprised all of us in the past, but I don't know what incentive he has to do that. Because right now, that's what has gotten him some things that he wants very much. One thing that he wants very much is recognition. He's already had a summit meeting with the president of China. He's had a summit meeting with the president of South Korea. He's apparently going to have a summit meeting with the president of the United States. And the premier of Japan says he wants to have a summit meeting with him as well. That's far more recognition than what this guy has had ever, or his predecessors, his father and his grandfather. So that's important, I think, for them, uh, and, and it makes him a different level of player than he's ever been before, and that's because of his nuclear weapons, and I don't know what incentive he has to walk away from that. So there's a lot I don't know because I'm not involved every day in all of this, but I think this is a longer-term problem. I believe in the near term it's a deterrence issue. I believe they can be deterred. I think that the principles that have existed between us and China and us and Russia for many, 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 many decades now apply in this case as well. And so I do not see a need to take some kind of immediate military action because I would then say, what outcome do you want? What's the purpose of the military action? If it's eliminate his weapons, that is a very tough problem, given that this is North Korea with the terrain, with the underground facilities, with the dispersion, uh, dispersion and all the other things. That's a very difficult problem, and I think you are risking an awful lot uh, in order to go do that. If it's, some have said, let's go give them a bloody nose. I think you all have a great saying, when the enemy's in range, so are you. I think the same thing is true in this case. You have soul is in range here of a lot of nasty things, that's the risk you are taking. And so I do not know what options have been looked at. I do, not, I do know that the military from open sources has prepared options. I'm sure they would. That's what they are supposed to do. But I, for the life of me, don't see a good one. Now, if we are responding to his aggression with a nuclear weapon, that's different. Then we have options for that. All bets are off and then the war is on. But if you're going to create a war to go in and do something here, because I don't see him accepting a bloody nose and saying, okay, I'm good now, because then I think he's gone. I don't think that he can do that. Um, if that's the case, then I, I think you are risking an awful lot. So I guess the short answer, that turned out to be a long answer, is I think I would, my strategy would be buy time buy time. Talk to them. Negotiate with them. I, I think that's fine. I think it will be interesting to see what it is we don't know about what has already been talked about in the background. And maybe there's a lot that's already been worked out in the background and therefore the president and, and Kim Jong-un sit down and, and are able to have some kind of a, of a meaningful conversation like that. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful that's what's been going on, is that there's something has been going on in the background here, and maybe we will all be very surprised by what comes out of this. I don't know. But I don't see, and I've talked to, I'm not a Korea expert, but I have talked to a bunch of them who are my friends, and um, I don't know, I've, I've talked to Korea experts who have served in both kinds of administrations, Republican and Democrat, and I have yet to talk to one who says he's gonna give up his nuclear weapons. That's what he's gonna do. I don't know, uh, may, maybe he will. I, I, it would be a great outcome 
well, I think it would be a great outcome. The other question is, what does it cost us? What will we have to do in order to get a deal here? Because a deal is usually two parties make a deal, and they don't either, neither one gets what they want, they make a deal that they can accept. So we'll see. I think there are a lot of open questions about this. Next. Sir. Sir, Cadet Tesla Company, I1. Um, sir, you mentioned briefly cyber threat. Um, and so it sounded a lot like the cyber threat is kind of moving into what was the nuclear threat. Um, you know, the fear of kind of mass proliferation that, you know, anybody can go on the internet now and, you know, download the plans for a nuclear weapon, like worst case scenario. Um, we see that in the cyber realm today. Anybody can go on the internet and learn how to hack any system and bring down, you know, bring those capabilities to bear. Um, we in the United States tried to build counter, -prolif counter proliferation strategies against nuclear weapons. Do you see us trying to leverage some of the same capabilities or trying to build new capabilities in the cyber realm as well along the same lines? Yeah, it's, that's another great question. Thank you for that. You know, um, I, there are some significant similarities between strategic weapons sort of across the board, broadly defining strategic in terms of their effect and, and the things that can be done. By the way, I think 9-11 was a strategic attack on the United States of America being done with airplanes, commercial airplanes. And so the question is, look, it's not what we would have considered to be a real weapon. Air, commercial airliners aren't what we would consider to be a real weapon. They're certainly not banned under any treaty. We haven't gone back and said, other than more security in airplanes, we haven't said you're gonna um, redesign the way uh, commercial airplanes are produced because of all of this. We're not gonna have an arms control treaty related to commercial airplanes. So, somewhere between nuclear weapons and commercial airplanes is sort of this cyber thing that can have tremendous strategic effect on a nation. So what do we do about it? Well, I think that there are probably as many lessons to be learned from commercial airplanes after 9-11 as there are to be learned from nuclear weapons in this case. I think you have increased security. I think you have increased awareness. I think you have vulnerabilities that you have to understand and mitigate. I think more resilience is required in cyberspace. And it's not just resilience in cyberspace, but we need to have mission resilience. So, because our space assets are being threatened today too, both through cyberspace and from the ground and in space in ways that they've never been threatened before. So mission resilience, if, if you expect to get precision navigation and, and location out of space, well, we need to have mission resilience here. So you get some of it from space, but if you don't have that, you got some chip in your device that's gonna help you or you learn how to use a sextant. I, I tell Navy guys, hey, rely on GPS, but bring your sextant because I think it's, it's a bad assumption that we learned from the desert to, to believe that it's always gonna be there. It isn't always gonna be there. And we used to train without that stuff. We used to operate without that stuff. And so we're gonna have to figure that out. So increased resilience, I think, is gonna be true in cyberspace. I think there's an offensive component to our ability to respond through cyberspace. That's, that's a key element of deterrence. And I think, just like people ask me about space deterrence, how do you do space deterrence? I tell them, well, you, you don't do space deterrence, you do deterrence, and space is part of that. I think the same thing is true with cyberspace. You don't do cyber deterrence, you, you do deterrence, and cyber is part of that. If you look at our national policy, both for space and cyberspace, they both say at some level that these are vital national interests for the United States of America, and if we are attacked in or through these domains, that we will respond to the time and the place and through the domain of our choosing. That's good policy, I think. Implementation is a little ragged. So how do you actually do that? Are there times when you should respond through cyberspace? Yes. Is that the only way you should deter? No, I think that, that again, if you looked at the nuclear posture review in um, the last one that Secretary Mattis signed just a couple of months ago when it was uh, promulgated, and by the way, I would commend that to you it's not everything in there is, is an exciting, it's a little bit like a physics book in my view, but you know, that's only parts of it. Some parts of it are like 
War and Peace. So you ought to pick it up and read it. The uh, interesting thing that that says is it has opened the door once again for, which we never slammed shut, but we kind of slid most of the way closed to use nuclear weapons in response to things that are not nuclear attacks. Depending on extreme circumstances, vital national interest, impact to the attack, those kind of things, we've said there could be circumstances where we would use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear strategic level attack that tripped our trigger for extreme circumstances where vital national interests are at stake. I got a lot of argument, by the way. The arms control community said, see, that proves it. These guys want to go fight a nuclear war. The other side said, nope, that just adds additional significance to our public policy that says we might consider this at the same level that we would have looked at a nuclear attack in the past. It just depends. So it provides another thing for an adversary to think about. Can I take the risk? Is it credible to think that the United States would respond that way? Uh, I mean, that all factors into this set of equations that you have to think about. But I think opening that door up again was probably a wise thing for us to do because of these kinds of issues. It's hard to tell and predict in advance what a massive cyber attack against our power grid might do. In the meantime, you hope that everybody's working to try to close those vulnerabilities. You don't want to have that kind of effect, but that will take a long time and cost a lot of money. Uh, the final thing th that I think is interesting about cyberspace, during most of my time in uniform, the biggest concern that I had when I looked at adversaries was their capabilities. What capabilities would they feel? Somebody, a mentor of mine told me years ago, hey, look, when you're thinking about adversaries, you need to think about two things, capability and intent. Their intent might be like this today, but tomorrow their intent can change. What doesn't change quickly is their capabilities. So you gotta be able to deter their capabilities, not their intent. And I think that's, that's a pretty wise thing. So I used to focus on capabilities, but here's what bothers me today. Because of the theft of all of this unclassified intellectual property and all of this unclassified information about our national security systems through cyberspace, I am more concerned today about what they know about us than I am about their capabilities. So you think about this for a minute. I can deal with somebody's ballistic missiles because I can see them. I know how they perform, I know what they do, I know how I can deter them, defend against them, mitigate against their impact. You pick it, I can figure out what to do about a capability. But if they know what my plans are, if they know where I intend to disperse and, and uh, distribute my forces and my activities, if they can get in and disrupt my ability to project power by telling the tankers to go somewhere else, or by diverting the ships, or some of you, I've never watched it in person, but you can go to Fort Hood and watch a loadout of, of an armored division down there. All of that is being done on unclassified internet stuff because the commercial transportation providers don't have CIPRANET, or they don't have these other means to keep things classified, and most of that information isn't classified. I think that's huge vulnerability for when I talk to audiences that have um, CEOs of large companies in them, particularly the defense contractors, but not just the defense contractors, I say to them, look, if I was building a better mousetrap, if I figured out how to do that, I wouldn't take the plans for it, put them in my pocket, walk to the bus stop, and hand them out. But that's essentially what you are doing if you don't put protections in place through the internet. If you allow your cyber vulnerabilities to be open. You know, I live in a nice neighborhood in suburban Washington, D.C. And maybe years ago, people didn't lock their front doors, but they certainly do now. So I lock my front doors at night. I've got smoke alarms in the house to alert me if there's a fire. And I leave my computer on all the time there's a wide open door into my house, into my personal life through the internet. 
No lock on a door prohibits that. No smoke alarm alerts me when somebody's screwing around in there. When I have the equivalent of a fire <laughs> in my computer, I, you know, or in my data, it's, it, we, we need to think differently. We put rules out years ago about how you build a classified room so that nobody can hear what's in there, how you search for bugs, how you do all that stuff. And then we say to the defense industry, but we don't care if you allow these wide open doors into your computers. It's crazy. It's just crazy. And I worry as much about that, sometimes more about what they know about us than what they could do to us physically through cyberspace. Does that help? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And all of you, no matter where you are, by the way, I hope we still have a minute or two. I was giving a talk to a joint audience the other day, and I said this. I asked, there, there were, all the services were there, and I said, okay, um, the Marines had self-identified, so I knew who the Marines were, and they were, plus they were in uniform, so that was easy. I said, okay, Marines, what's every Marine? And you know what they said? A rifleman, because that's what they say. And it turns out that's their culture. Every Marine's a rifleman. I said to the sailors, what's every sailor? They said a firefighter. That's true, because when they go through Great Lakes, it's all about, you know what, if that ship catches fire, we are all going to drown. <laughs> so everybody's a firefighter. They don't say, I better call the fire department here. Nope, it's them. My view is that every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine needs to be a cyber warrior to the extent that we are training them with battlefield cyber skills. So like all of you, I carry one of these around. When I open this thing up, I am in cyberspace. I am in the battle space. If I am logging in with my CAC, which I now have again, I'm not, I'm not authorized to be on any government computer system, I don't think I'm trustworthy, but if I logged in again, or when I used to log in, you are entering the cyber battle space. Are we giving your soldiers, the battlefield skills they need to operate in that battle space, you wouldn't send them into the battlefield and not train them on what the lethal radius, the lethal blast radius is of a hand grenade. Because if you did that, you would be derelict in your job, derelict in your duties. But who trains them on the battlefield skills they need in cyberspace? And my view is everybody's a cyberspace warrior to the extent that they need battlefield skills. And everybody gets trained to some basic level of battlefield skills, right? This is what your helmet does. This is what your vest does. This is how it all works. And we learned that during Iraq and Afghanistan because we sent a whole bunch of Air Force people who didn't have those battlefield skills forward with all of you. And before they went, they went to some army place and people said, here are the battlefield skills you need to be able to survive on the battlefield. And so, it's, there's some common level of training that everybody needs to get. And so, think about that as, as you go forward as well. I think All right, if you could, uh, give our uh, guest speaker a round of applause. Thank him for coming. Thank you. He's probably got a few minutes if any of you have any uh, extra questions you want to ask, but otherwise, uh, you're free to go. Thanks.